Hi, Fashion Dolls. It is Motivation Monday. Happy MLK Day. And it is Motivation Monday, January 16th. And welcome to an all-new episode of Style by Stevie. Now, we were supposed to have our girl talk with this beautiful actress Friday. But things change and things happen. She got a little tied up in traffic and things. But she's here joining us today. And I'm super excited to have her here. You guys are not only getting not one but two girl chats, and I'm super excited to have our very special guest, Miss DGIA, DGIA McCowan. She's going to be joining me. So this is our first girl chat, and then the next one, we have Danielle Ward. She's going to be joining me, and then we have Mr. Ward. He's going to be joining us also as well, too, so make sure you guys tune in for that. You guys are getting three shows today, back to back. So without further ado, let's welcome our beautiful special guest. Here to the dollhouse for some girl talk. Miss DJ A. McCallie. Hello. 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 I am Hi. wonderful. How are you? It is such a pleasure to have you here. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. I can't wait to answer this all your questions. This is going to be a great girl talk. Now, before we get into this interview and kick off this conversation, how has 2023 mm-hmm. been for you thus far? Because from what I'm seeing on your Instagram, you've been in project after project after project. And one of my personal favorites that I've seen you in was Pimp Camp. And that mm-hmm. is an amazing project. Yes. So make sure you guys go and check it out. It's all about female empowerment. And I just love how the women in that film come together. Mm-hmm. Now, you play the character of Star. And it was one scene in the film where mm-hmm. you and your mom in the film, and I was like, oh, yeah, that, that happens in the Black household. So we know all too well about that. What was it like playing the character of Star? Um, playing Star was fun because I got, a, I got to play around with the character. She was a little younger than me because uh, I'm 25, and I played a 16, 17-year-old girl. So it was kind of fun to play around with and, you know, just get creative. Um, I was kind of nervous with the fighting scene with uh, Renee Warren Peoples. That's who my, played my mom in Pinterest. Um, it was kind of scary and tense because she's so sweet and I'm sweet. And I'm like, oh, my God, I don't want to have this altercation with you. But after we filmed it, everything was good. And that's pre- and she's great. dominant she's great. in the black household. But it teaches a very valuable lesson mm-hmm. to young girls out here about you know, sex trafficking, as well as so many things that Black women, women of color in general, go through within the community and that aspect. So welcome. Now, I see you all are coming in. Welcome. Thank you guys for joining us. Please let me know how to pronounce your name because I think I butchered it in the beginning. It's Deja. Deja Deja And my fraternal shout outs to Island Yankee. He says, and I'm pretty sure you get this a lot because when I looked at you, I had to do a double take. Like, wait, am I looking at Kyla Pratt or Ashley from the Hughley? Because you <laughs> resemble both of them. Do you get that a lot? I do get that a lot. Everyone says I look like Kyla Pratt all through high school. They're like, Kyla Pratt, Kyla Pratt. So especially off the of Dr. Doolittle because I wear glasses too. So that makes me look like Kyla Pratt more too. Now, as well. uh, also one more thing people don't know about you is you're a mom. So how do you find that balance with being an actress? Because you're not only an actress, but you're an mm-hmm. artist and a model as well too. How do you find that balance with all things? Um... It's kind of hard. Well, last year, I was really more into the acting. I was getting booked a lot of gigs. So, and with the modeling, you only get paid if you have an agent. And I was a freelance model. So, I was just doing fashion shows for free, just, you know, to show off the clothes and everything. And just to get myself out there, build my resume. But once acting started to play a major part in my life, that's when I was just like, you know, I'm just focused on acting. And I do my art on my free time. Okay, okay. Now we're going to really get personal because I know you've had some some challenges in the in- industry, both of us as Black women. So here's where the girl talk comes Ooh. into play. What are some of the challenges that you face? Because I've had the conversation with plenty of other women who have been in the industry, and I'm pretty sure Vanessa Williams, you've seen the interview that I did with her. Um, Cherry, Cherry Johnson from the hit show Family Matters. She spoke about some of the changes and a few other mm-hmm. actresses that I've spoken with as well, too. Angelique Bates, she did the show All That. So the list goes on and on. 
-hmm. So for you, Deja, what are some of the challenges that you face in the industry? Um, as of right now, it's just really, since I'm getting booked so much and back to back, it's really hard for me to get into character like that. It's really hard because I'm coming from one script to another and it's, I'm playing these different emotions and these different personalities. So it's like, how can I get into this character that fast? So that's the challenge challenge for me it really is a challenge because I play lead roles and supporting roles I really don't get a lot of small parts so when I'm facing these leading roles and these supporting roles it's like my mind is everywhere my mind is everywhere I'm like okay I have to act happy for her I have to act all happy and bubbly for her but this next project I'm playing mean girl tough gangster chick so that's where it's like okay where's the balance in that you know so it's like when i'm going into that gangster role it's like i have to remember my i have to remind myself not to be so bubbly and so sweet because that's my personality already and it's it, that's the kind of challenge for me um another challenge is just working with different directors and for the first time and not knowing how they are on set it's kind of nerve-wracking because I have good, bad anxiety as well. So when I get on set, I'm just like, I just hope they like me. I hope I'm doing what they want, you know? And I don't really get a lot of directions on set. So and that's a good thing. you're doing excellent. That, and that's unfortunate for some other actresses that have been in the business. Like, Vi there's an issue with pay. Um, Viola Davis spoke about it. And I'm pretty sure you heard about it. Uh, where actors, especially Black actresses, mm -hmm. are not getting paid enough. And yesterday was the Critics' Choice Award. So I'm pretty sure you've seen Angela Bassett, Niecy Nash, Carol Lou Ralph, all three of them. Yeah. These are the vets. These are the women who have paved the way for women like us to be in the position that we're in. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing everything that they've overcame to get where they're at in their career and have that status of EGOT. But Angela never won an Oscar. So is that something that you will manifest for yourself in the future? Yes, ma'am. Of course. I, have, I would love to be at the Oscar. That's my goal is to be at the Oscars and actually win one. And also at the Emmys, too. I also want to produce and make my own films and direct them and make my own films. And there, well, so. Yeah, and to add I'm on to that, there's not a whole lot of women of color film writers. I mean, you've got Ava DuVernay. You've got yeah. Lena Waithe. You've got um, Regina King, of course, um, and a few others. And then Nisi mm -hmm. Nash and Angel, like they've done their directing debuts, but you've seen very little. Like the microscope was back then for women of color producer, like Living Single, mm -hmm. everybody knows that show. Yvette, Yvette Lee Browser was the opening door for so many other women. And then you had Gina Prince who did Love and Basketball and The Secret Life of Bees. So they were the blueprint, and they opened so many doors mm -hmm. for other women of color to come along, like the Regina Kings and so many others. Because nowadays in 2023, we're now in the year of 2023, and I say this is the year of the woman, where so many things are starting to yeah. open up and horizons for us as women of color. Now, being transparent here, because you said sometimes it's difficult to get into some of these characters, you know, you got to go through this type of emotion and this emotion and this emotion now thank you to a place how what do you do to protect your peace while you're on set because i know it's a lot for you as an actress with all of these directors coming at you once they want you to do everything you want to make sure that the shots come out perfect and everything how do you make sure that you're right. mentally there and your piece is intact before you go into character for these roles? <sighs> you know I am in love with nature, you know, that grow. Um, so with that being said, I just, you know, I, I step off the set, I go outside and, you know, I take my medicine and I listen to my music and I, I get prepared to get into that character. That's how I maintain. For me, it's set. a whole different experience girl like I'm, I'm like Erica Badu I'm like Zen I got to have my candles and stuff I gotta make sure I'm in the right mindset mm -hmm. before I come on and do interviews and stuff and give people these amazing conversations like these because it is opening doors for other people who are watching mainly women of color so my girl talks mm -hmm. have been very empowering to so many people even men watch the girl talks and they're just like wow 
And disclaimer, let me put this out here because I know men watch the show as well too. We are not male bashing. We are giving our experience as black women on this platform here. Just a disclaimer because I will get DMs, yeah. girl, from men sometimes saying, oh, well, why you got to go there, Miss Stevie? Why you got to bash the men? Why you got to bash us? And I'm just like, no. But these are things that we go through. We oftentimes get gaslit right. whenever we speak out about any of our experiences on set. And it's just like it, dis it just gets disregards. And to the women who came before us, like um, Hattie McDaniel, who was the first woman to win an Academy Award, the Eartha Kitts of the world, um, Shirley Ralph, they, these women have all had their challenges in the industry, being Black and today's MLK Day. So you can only imagine back then what these women had to go through, being told that you had to go through another door because you're, this is not your kind and all these, all of these other things. It's, it's terrible. So let me see. We got a question down here. Because you look like Kyla, do you think it's difficult for others to see you as you? That's a great question, Allie. That is a good question. And no, I don't think it's bad because I tell people all the time, like there is no right. competition at all because everybody is their selves they're, they're themselves so when i act it's like i'm acting as me when you act you're acting as you whether we say the same phrase or do the same action or the same motion you're always going to be you and i'm always going to be me so i don't think there is any comparison just looks yes but me and kyla pratt we don't act the same at all but, but. You both have that bubbly personality. I've seen her in interviews. That's the only thing. But you're your own person. And I'm glad you said that because that's another yes. thing they try to do to us in the industry as well, too, as women, is they try to pit us against each other. And we're noticing even in the, I'm going to mm -hmm. dive a little bit deeper, even in the hip hop music industry, they try to pit female artists against, oh, Kim is better than Nikki. Nikki's better than Kim. They're all good. And you're supposed to say, I'm the baddest, this, that, yeah. and third, because the male, the, the rap industry and the acting industry, everything is basically male dominated. And it's like women, we have to claw and box and fight our way to the top to prove ourselves. I know for me, I've had to do a lot to, to keep this platform, to keep it grounded and get interviews set. And I'm going to be transparent and open with the audience here. It has, next time, tell the men to inbox me for Turner. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Yes, they don't play about us. We have men who are surrounding us, <laughs> who are protective of us. And Island Yankee is one of those men. K Toops is one of those men. And I'm pretty sure you see him in the audience. But it's good to have men around you to protect you in this industry and not the ones who are back there orchestrating and pulling the strings and trying to pit women against each other. And I've seen that happen. And I'm just like, even in the hip hop world, where it's just like, yeah, you're supposed to say I'm the best, I'm the baddest or whatever, but you're letting these men sometimes they be the one main ones pushing up the beef keeping it going keeping it going and then for years mm -hmm. you hear it go on like for years i've heard about lil kim nikki i'm not I, I love them both i think they're both incredibly talented i've called nikki out and held right. her accountable for certain things i've called kim out and held her accountable for certain things but at the end of the day they both have to realize that they're both black women and in this industry where they spit on mm -hmm. us and it's like the weight of the world is already on our back because we have to tolerate so much. And we oftentimes get gaslit and not believe that things have happened to us behind the scenes. Or they will do like what Kay Michelle says, and they will try to pit bodies on. And they'll say, oh, I had to sleep. She slept with me. Mm -hmm. You know, I slept with her, this, that, and third. And I'm just like, no, no, no. That didn't happen. They don't believe you. So... Yeah, it, it's a lot of the, it's a lot of that in this industry. I'm glad you talked you brought it up, Deja, because it happens in this industry to us where we're oftentimes pitted against. And I give you another example. Now, don't eat me up, y'all. Brandy and Monica, they have been in the music industry mm. for a long time. Here is two Grammy Award winning singers, both mentored by the greatest voice of all time, Whitney Houston. And both of these girls had their own individual singing style. Coming into the industry young, not knowing what to expect about this industry. And that's leading up to my next question to you, Deja, because you have a daughter. She's going to come to you one day, and I'm pretty sure she already has, and say, Mom, I want to be an actress. I want to get into the business. So get ready for it, girl. It's coming. 
But Brandy <laughs> had to prep her daughter Sarah for it as well too. And her um her mom, they went on our studio together, and our studio asked mm. them, "Are you going to let your daughter become a singer too?" Brandy said, "No, no, no. This industry, y yes, this industry. They they warned me about this industry and how it's dog eat dog it is." Mm -hmm. And I, I don't have any kids. I have, oh I have my no God. kids. <laughs> Not yet. It's coming. It's coming. Yes, it, it's mm -hmm. coming. So I'm pretty sure when you get your kids and everything, your daughter's going to come to you and she's going to mm -hmm. say, because I've interviewed people who, who have their daughters and stuff who are already out here acting, and they warn them about the business yes. and the entertainment yeah. industry. There's so many programs out here that can help you if you need to get where you need to be behind the music, um, unsung. Mm -hmm. Uh, it used to come on E! True Hollywood Stories and you hear actors get out here um, and tell their stories. There's another show that comes on TV One, Uncensored. And we've seen um, Sally, Sally Richardson, I think Tamar Braxton and a lot of these other actors and singers get up here and tell their story about how what happened. Nia Long is another one. Nia Long has been in the game for a long time. Boys in the Hood, Soul Food, you guys know her, and she's still out here. The Best Man, um, final chapter, they just wrapped that. So she's still out here acting and doing her thing. Mm -hmm. She opened up about the challenges of being a woman in the industry and being labeled, because they've labeled her difficult to work with. They've labeled her angry. They've labeled her as mm -hmm. aggressive. Deja, I wanted to ask you this, one Black woman to another Black woman. How do you feel mm -hmm. about the ABW? And for those of you who don't know what the ABW is, Black women were sick and tired of hearing it. It is the angry Black woman mm -hmm. narrative. Uh, ABW is it's a very touchy subject because I don't feel like a lot of people know what Black women go through and especially in this industry like it's it's hard like you said we have to fight our way to the top sometimes we get overlooked so in order for us to not get overlooked we have to speak up for ourselves and sometimes it may come off aggressive or it may come off wrong but at the end of the day like all i am i'm just speaking up for myself because i want to get to the next level and if i have to push you to to get to that next level then that's what i'm going to do but i just I, I don't like it. I don't, I don't like the angry black woman narrative at all because it's like, it's not that I want to be angry. It's not that I want to come off aggressive. It's just, you're not giving me my recognition. You're not recognizing me. You're not seeing my talent and I know I'm talented. So that's how I feel on the angry black woman narrative because it's, it's, it's hard out here. It is. It really and is. so many um, other like Taraji P. Henson spoke about, you know, drop the strong. Yeah. I love her. And I too. love her. The strong black woman narrative. There are days it's, it's try. It's like, you're trying to make us seem like we're invincible. And sometimes we, we we're not invincible. Mm -hmm. We're not superhuman. It's okay to break. There are days when I don't want to, put up the the strong black woman put on my cape and be the strong warrior for mm -hmm. black women that's what that's what's expected to us and it's it's been tr come down to us from generation to generation from our mothers to our ancestors our, our yeah. aunts the women in our family have been expected to do that especially during the slavery era when you know they had us in chains and everything the, the women were expected to be strong, to be stoic. Black people as a collective, we were expected to be strong and stoic. And that's just not the case at all. There are days when I don't want to be superhuman. Mm -hmm. I don't want to put on a cape and save the world. I, I just want to break down and be vulnerable. And Taraji P. Henson said that in an interview, yeah. you know, we're not superhuman. So let that down. The narrative of being a strong Black woman and being the angry Black woman is both dangerous. And I'm going to tell you why it's dangerous, you guys, because mm -hmm. it contributes to massage war. They already view Black women, our shapes, our bodies, our bone structures, our features, all of these things. And I'll give you a prime example. Our First Lady, Michelle Obama, our, our former First Lady, Michelle Obama, the tyranny that they put this woman through years of being in the White House by seeing how, how muscular her arms look. I mean, hell, Serena Williams 
even had to experience the same thing. Exactly. And now you've got Meg Thee Stallion mm -hmm. and Brittany Grinner. This, these women of color are facing what's called, and the term has been coined by Moya Bailey, who is a black woman, misogynoir. And what misogynoir is, is making a woman feel less than a woman by saying she's strong. She's mm. statuesque. Meg is a tall girl. I'm a tall girl too. And I'm, I'm tall, statuesque. You guys have seen the photos and everything. But you think I'm small on camera, but I'm a tall girl. I'm like five, seven and a half. So, I mean, yeah, it's difficult because you have an industry that is full of misogyny already and patriarchy by saying, oh, well, she looks less than a woman. Her hands are big. She looks mustard. For years, that's what Michelle Obama had to endure. And she was all about, one thing I can say about this woman was she was all about making sure that people were healthy. She wanted to make sure that people protect their mm -hmm. mental health and their peace. And now that she's not the first lady anymore, she's saying the things that she wanted to say during her time. She couldn't say during her time as first lady where, when it comes to mental health and making sure that you are all right. And she just recently did, I think it was a campaign for her book tour. And she said in the interview, I am me. This is me in the pink. I can't change who I am, but I can work on the things that I need to work on to better myself, to make sure that I am better, that I am good. And we both like Taraji, so you, I know you've probably seen her interview she did with Angie Martinez not too long ago. Um, she said in the interview, mm -mm. I'm, Angie asked her, was she happy? And she said, am I happy? Not really. I'm not happy in the prime of my life. And it's okay to normalize mental health. So that's another thing in this business. Getting into this business, you have to make sure that you're mentally there to, to act, to sing, to mm -hmm. host a platform like myself. For me, it's draining because I do it five days a week. Five days a week. Every week. Five days a week. Monday through Friday. And it's exhausting and it takes a toll on your body. But what gives me the strength to keep going is the supporters and God. God is what gives me, and that's the <laughs> only person you, you got to make sure that you have a good support circle around you, because we we seen what happened with the young lady who went on the trip, Shanquella. I don't even want to dive too deep into that. It's it's emotional talking about it because I'll just say this: be careful who you surround yourself with in this industry and in this business, because everybody that you think is your friend is not your friend and does not have your best interest at heart. Iyala Van Zandt said, it's okay to say that you hurt me. It's okay to say that this person is toxic to me, that this person has called me harm. It's okay to say those things. It's okay to not be okay in this moment. And I've had to realize that. I've had to cut off certain friendships with men who were in the industry because they would say, oh, well, you're doing the same old thing. Well, what do you expect me to do? You wouldn't understand it. You wouldn't understand it as a black right. woman. You would not understand what I would have to go through. And I had two male co-hosts on this platform. <laughs> oh, sometimes Johnny, Marco, EJ, well, three. I've had three male co-hosts. Hey, Tina. Shout out to my girl, Tina Marie. She says, y'all both beautiful. Amen. And you are too, Tina. And we just recently did a collab you, <laughs> for Bath and Body Works semi-annual sale. So make sure you guys go and check that out. It, yes, they wrapped up and the new spring rollout is out today. So make sure you guys go and follow my girl, Tina. I touched on something when she was here Friday. Colorism. Danger, and I'm pretty sure you've heard this term throughout the industry. Um, it was a rapper that just recently came out and spoke out about it on a platform. And Megan from the bad is it Megan James from the Bad Girls Club kind of gaslit her experience. Yes. Like then you had Masika. Masika, we're calling you in, sis. I'm I'm gonna have to call you in. Mm -hmm. <sighs> I'm gonna say this because I, I don't want to offend my light skinned sisters. As a chocolate sister, all my life I've been called ugly. I have been called skyscraper for being the tallest in the classroom. I have been called tar baby. I've been called every name in the book. And this is as transparent as you're gonna as I'm gonna be with you guys. And do you guys remember, you guys know Atlanta Housewives, right? Do you guys know Kenya Moore and Eva, who's on all the Queens men? Um, Kenya had to educate Eva mm -hmm. on the reunion. This is when Nene was on there, on colorism. 
Kenya basically told Eva, yes, Eva, you are a woman with lighter eyes, light hair. And we know that as Black women, that's a stereotype against us also as well, too. And I'm going to talk to you about that, too, Deja, is uh, the good hair stigma. We, we've seen the microaggressions, even in the workplace. You don't even have to be in the entertainment business. You could be working in Starbucks or wherever or Chick-fil-A. And, and we've seen videos of girls having to take out their braids, having to take out, ma'am, could you take the fro out? Could you do this? I'm like, no, my fro, my braids is a part of what makes me uniquely me, a Black woman. And that's a part of the Black aesthetic. And I was watching, um, you girls, guys know, I'm naming all the famous names today, but I'm, all of these women had to go through things, um, escape. Um, someone in the comments, I was watching one of their music videos, and this is back in the late 90s. Someone said, yeah, I bet that hair salon smell like pink hair lotion. I said, you better know it. If it's not that, right. black women, we got it all <laughs> in our bathrooms. It, it's, it's a toothbrush for our baby hairs. We've got that ORS, mm -hmm. that pink hair lotion, that pump it up spritz, that bubble curl, all of that. And that yes, a hot comb on that's the stove. a part of the black aesthetic. These are things that we are not going to get through. And now everybody's going natural. So microaggression is one thing, but I'm going to piggyback mm -hmm. to colorism. When the conversation of colorism okay. came up, Eva checked Kenya. Well, Kenya checked Eva and said, well, you are a woman with fair skin. So when you make comments like mm -hmm. nappy hair, old nappy hair, I'm going to give you the context of that because I, I hate it too. It makes you think about a bale of cotton during slavery. And no one, and I mean no one, ever wants to be compared to that. No one, or should not have to. All black hair is good hair. And the hair mm -hmm. textures that I've worked through throughout the years of my, my career being a cosmetologist, I'm thankful for. I'm thankful for. Every shade of melanin is beautiful. And Cheryl Lee Ralph on the red carpet caught a little bit of backlash because she's like, you don't have to be these Kardashians because women are going out here and surgically changing their features. And I'll give you a mm -hmm. prime example. Lil' Kim. Lil' Kim did not look mm -hmm. the way she did now back then. And it's because of the industry that has told mm -hmm. her, your black is not beautiful enough. Your features, you can see I have big nose, big lips, almond-shaped eyes, strong features. This is what makes us uniquely unique. And there are certain rappers, mm -hmm. sorry, fellas, if these are your faves. Lil Wayne, I'm going to have to call you in, too. And 50 Cent, I'm going to have to call you in, too. Mm -hmm. We know when these rappers get with certain women in the industry, they do not look like myself, Deja, mm -hmm. or Tina. They don't. So when I did the conversation with Tina and we were talking about the SAS Bath and Body Works, Tina called it out on one of the videos. Make sure you guys go and subscribe to her. True Meaning of the Radiance, there she is. Um, she said something. She said colorism. I said, girl, I, I don't know if she's going to take it home, but I'm going to take it home. Right? And I took it home. And I said, I'm going to call it what it is. It's colorism. It's colorism. They don't see darker skin as beautiful. They don't see women of color as beautiful because they, they don't know the variety of chocolate that that cup that comes at all shades. Mm -hmm. Back then, it was called light skin versus dark skin. There's a term for it now. It's called colorism, and it stemmed during racism. It stemmed, and it's on the scale of racism as well too, because you're dividing yourself away from people based on your skin complexion. And I've seen people say, "Oh well." Um, it was a rapper, ASAP Rocky said, I wish I was light skinned. I said, boy, you better love your melanin. Love right. the skin that you are in. Because these babies, these young girls out here are watching platforms like this. Women like us, myself and Deja and Tina, watching their channels, watching our platforms and, and watching films with Deja in it, and seeing us and saying, my black isn't good enough. And I'm pretty sure all of us as little girls growing up have had that look in the mirror and tell ourselves we, we don't feel pretty. We don't feel ugly. We, I mean, we don't feel pretty. We feel ugly. And it's because people have yeah. torn us down and broke us down so bad to the point where we don't see our beauty within ourselves. And I'm going to... And I blame the society now and the generation, the 
the rappers, like you said, the rappers and social media, everyone bashing uh, light skinned people or mixed biracial people. It's, it's, it's the generation, I feel like, and it's the social media that gets to, to a lot of people's head that makes them yes. want to change. Themselves. And there is something called pretty privilege. Women who are desirable. Mm -hmm. So you guys know about pretty privilege. You know about light skin privilege. Um, mm -hmm. Masika put out a comment, and this was not too long ago last week when the rapper got on the podcast with Megan and spoke out about it and said, you know, I experienced colorism. And it's predominantly in the industry because for me growing up, the rappers that I seen that looked like me were Foxy Brown, Lauren Hill, and maybe MC Light. Mm -hmm. These were the women that I seen that grew up, that, and Meg Thee Stallion as well, too, in this era, in this generation. But back then, it was Lauren Hill mm -hmm. and Foxy Brown. All the other girls, Eve, uh, Lil' Kim, they were lighter. They were, well, Kim mm -hmm. was kind of in between, but those were the girls that I seen that looked like me. The thing I don't like about mm -hmm. being dark is being oh yeah <laughs> she is very no that that's a black thing that that's not a dark skin thing that's a black thing yes <laughs> I get it too I get ashy too but yes that was a thing back then <laughs> not being able to find the correct foundation shade now we've got a plethora mm -hmm. of foundation companies yes. thank God for Rihanna thank God yes I Rihanna was Rihanna broke boundaries when she created an inclusive foundation line that it created 50 shades for every hue. And now you've got all of these brands, Mac, I don't even know if people still use Mac anymore. Um, Lady Gaga House of Laboratories has now become inclusive to women of color as well too. So, and, and so many other brands out here, Fashion Fair, Fashion Fair was, you flip through the pages of what? Ebony and Jet Magazine, you've seen a Fashion Fair ad. And I'm pretty sure everybody's mom Growing up in the black household, we used to sneak and get in there, that ruby red lipstick from Fashion Fair for my mom. That pink packaging is what drew us in. And our mama get mad and be like, oh, that's my damn. <laughs> that's my damn shade. I can't find it no more. But they revamped Fashion Fair now. And it's inclusive to every shade of beautiful melon. So that's what I love about it. When I saw that they bought Fashion Fair back and it's inclusive, because that was an issue back then with supermodels. Because I've interviewed Connie Fleming and Cara Young, who are two of the biggest top models there is in the world. Walked for Chanel and Gucci and Versace and all these other many designers as well. And Mugler as well also, when they came here on the platform. They spoke about how difficult it was being a model back then. And even Tyra Banks and Naomi Campbell said women would have, to, models of color would literally have to bring their own foundation shades and their own hair textures, their own yeah. hair products, because they couldn't do our hair textures. And when we go in, that's where we're going off into the next part of the conversation with textualism and mm -hmm. what's the other thing, microaggression, how them not being really capable to handle our hair. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you some more stories because I do a lot of reading. Um, you guys remember Tia Mari from Sister, yeah. the show Sister, Sister, right? When they first started off, they had their mm -hmm. naturally curly texture hair. Notice when they got into their college years, that's when their hair became straight. And mm -hmm. both styles look great. I love their naturally curly hair, and then I love the straight hair as well, too. So Tia mm -hmm. said it was difficult for them back then, the hairstylists on set, to do their hair because they couldn't find things for their texture. They wouldn't know what to do with their hair texture. Where is if you were, you know, yeah. the other kind, it would be easier for them to work with your hair. It would be easier. It's nothing. So when I see high fashion mm -hmm. companies not being able to work with models' hair texture, it's just like, wow, there's got to be somebody. Hire the people who we know how to handle our own hair texture. We know how to handle our own melanin. Exactly. And I'm pretty sure, Deja, for you, that's the next question. Texturism and my question when it comes to hair. Mm -hmm. Now, for you as an actress, I'm pretty sure you've had your challenges on set, too. But there are other actresses as well. Just like Kim Fields, living single, said, I wore wigs on set all the time because... Mm -hmm. As an actress, you know, DJ, that being up under that light all the time can be damaging to your hair. It can be harmful to your hair. So for you as an actress, how do you feel about microaggressions when it comes to black hair and the entertainment business? 
Um, well, I haven't had the luxury of getting my hair done on set yet. I just stick to doing my own hair and I wear wigs as well. I switch up the wigs all the time. But um, I feel like there's so many talented, you know, uh, African American people out here that know how to do hair, but I just feel like they're not given the opportunity to get to that point to do people's hairs on set because I guess they don't trust them enough or I don't know I don't know why, but like I said, it's just hard for our people to get there. No one's opening doors for them. Issa Rae, like. she said it best. Um, we need to root for everybody that's black. And that includes black makeup on, black hairstylists, mm -hmm. because we, as a people, POC, people of color, we understand our skin tones. And our skin tones are more, there's going to be more richness in one skin tone. There's going to be more lightness. There's going to be gold undertones. We understand our skin tones. We understand us as a people. So hire these makeup artists that are willing to give us the opportunity to do what we need to do to other actors and actresses on set. Hire the hairstylists that understand our hair texture. Because all the time, exactly. you know, we're going to wear wigs because being up under that lighting is damaging to your hair. If not that, then mm -hmm. it's a lot of curling. It's a lot of thermal utensils. So, yeah, it can literally damage mm -hmm. your hair. Kenya Moore spoke about it. Tia Mori spoke about it. Kim Fields spoke about it. Even Taraji, she said, I used because Taraji used to do hair back in the day. And she said, I invented this line because being on set sometimes, they wouldn't have products for my hair. And even certain models, there was one picture that really made me so upset and I cringed looking at it. Everybody knows Naomi Campbell, right? One of the top supermodels in the world. Mm -hmm. What was she known for? Her walk and her signature fierce ponytail. There was another model, another black model. And they had some of the fro in the front out and they just pinned the ponytail on the back. I said, well, what is this? Why are you not hiring hairstylists of color? You just did her hair anyway. Whereas the right. other models here, even Victoria's Secret did it one time and they got called out for it. They posted all of the models, you know, it was modeling sleepwear or whatever. Mm -hmm. And they posted all of the models with their hair well done. And for the black model, her hair wasn't done mm -hmm. all the way. Even on um, the news channel, mm -hmm. I think news program um, was a good one in America. Mm -hmm. One of the hairstylists said, "You just let the I, model do. You just did the model hair any kind of way." Yep, the uh, Fashion Nova, uh, these clothing online websites, they just don't do the models' hair. I'm just like, why? <laughs> If you're going to pay oh a model God. for a job, make sure that you provide a stylist that is capable of doing ethnic hair or African-American hair. Because we understand mm -hmm. us more than anything. And I'm tired of seeing it. When I seen it, I just cringed. I said, no, no, that's not it. It should have been slit back. If you're going to do a ponytail, mm -hmm. us girls out here, black girls especially, we know. That, that baby hair got to be on point. Mm -hmm. That slick back for that ponytail got to be on point. And mm -hmm. back then, I, was, mm -hmm. I seen pictures of Naomi Campbell literally sitting in the chair in the dressing room backstage doing her makeup. Not only Naomi, but Tyra, Beverly Johnson, mm -hmm. and all the other models. There's pictures of them literally out here doing that. In my opinion, they only hire who understand one demographic to keep their others on a not equal, so equal level. Yes, absolutely. And there's a whole documentary out here on that, how difficult it was for supermodels back then in the 90s, the 80s, and different other eras of fashion. There's a, there's a whole documentary that Iman came up with. And Zendaya's in the documentary. Cara Young is in the documentary. I've had the pleasure mm -hmm. of interviewing Cara. She's a good friend of mine. Um, and she supports the platform. And so many others, you hear them speak out and say, well, I've endured this. I've endured racism. I've endured colorism. I've, be, I've endured being told that my look is not what they're looking for. And that predominantly happens in this business, in this industry. Because back in the day, you would have to have to be a certain height. Most of the girls were like 5'9 mm -hmm. to 6'1". I wouldn't meet that criteria. So somebody out here right. said... In the comments, DM me the other day, not too long ago, I said, well, you can be a model. You've got the tall frame for it. I said, uh, no, I, I, I could not. I would mm -hmm. not meet the criteria of what they're looking for because 
nowadays you still have that same old school mentality that back then you had where they want the models to look a certain way they want the hair they're not capable of doing our hair or just in general the height requirement mm -hmm. to meet the height requirement you want to show in a certain yeah. size now too. and and i thank god now that in the, the fashion business is now becoming size inclusive and saying that we're not just going to showcase one size we're going to showcase all size but you still have some designers who are just it's a one trick pony for them they got to do the same thing over and over again just one size but now you're seeing designers like christian seriano and mark jacobs and mm -hmm. zach posen and so many others who are being size inclusive with their collection and being in the fashion and beauty world, I, I'm seeing that day in, day out. And I'm, I'm just loving it. I'm loving it. Models like uh, Precious Lee, she's she's beautiful. Um, her size model. And mm -hmm. Ashley, what's her name? Ashley Graham. All of these women are breaking barriers for full figure, curvy women out here that want to model. And it's just like when you flip through or you go on Instagram, like Deja said in the beginning of the interview, Mid Park, she said, uh, Instagram makes it even worse because we see all of these women with the nice bodies. And let me tell you, one who I can't stand, I cannot stand her, but in a good way I can't stand her, is Tiana Taylor. Her oh, body, Tiana's body, it's, it's like you can sit a Coke on top of her abs. It's just like... And, and mm -hmm. that put a lot of pressure on a lot of other women. Like, ooh, how do I get like that? Even Beyonce. After post-pregnancy, it's just like, how does she bounce mm -hmm. back? So it's a lot of pressure on women to bounce back and have the perfect body, the perfect shape. Not only women, but men as well, too. They see the washboard abs, and they're just like, listen, mm -hmm. I, I'll date a man about Sherman Club size. I don't care, damn. I do not. <laughs> I do mm -hmm. not. It, but to me, it's this is what matters, and I want people to take away from this. You are beautiful in your own divine way because God created you in his own divine way. You're not like other people. When I had a conversation with my mom not too long ago, just the other day, and she's saying, you know what? There's nothing wrong with being different. I look at people in the world and if right. we were all the same, it would be born, right? Looking mm -hmm. at the same thing. Mm -hmm. I wanna see something different. And there's nothing wrong with being different, a different size, a different shape, having a different nose, a different lip, all of these things that make us mm -hmm. uniquely us, there's nothing wrong with that. So love and appreciate these things out here that make you uniquely you, authentically yourself. And Cheryl exactly. Lee Ralph, I posted in my stories, um, she said, look at you in the mirror and love you. Love you. Because for years, I wanted to, I'm being, this is as transparent and as candid as you guys are getting it all. I wanted, to, I wanted to get my nose done. I wanted to get plastic surgery. I didn't think I had the most beautiful face. And and I wanted to just get certain things about myself. I picked out things about myself that I didn't feel was beautiful. I got things about my lips. But there are women who are literally going under the knife, who are not black women to get these lips, to get these teeth. So... When I seen Sonny exactly. Hostin on the view, I'm like, Sonny, you shouldn't have got anything done to your face. You look the same. I, I mean, she's beautiful. There's nothing wrong with it. Nothing wrong with cosmetic surgery. To each his own, you do you. But you're beautiful and right. celebrate your natural beauty. And I say this all the time, makeup mm -hmm. artists are surgeons. The things mm -hmm. that you don't have, your makeup artist can give you. I'm telling you. My eyes are yes. all misshaped, mm -hmm. but thank you throw me on a lash and a good eyeliner, and that baby, that eye will turn into something like Nikki, because Nikki is known for her eyeliner. So, Nikki Minaj is known for her eyeliner, and I love a winged eye. So you take that and you turn it into what God is giving you. You you alter your features with makeup. That's what I do. It just enhances your natural beauty. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and what I always say is if you, how do you expect someone to love you if you can't love yourself? Absolutely. How are you? How do you know that you're loving that person fully if you don't even love Absolutely. yourself? Absolutely. And self love begins with, from within because we're in the business of beauty. Be mm -hmm. Deja being an actress, me being a talk show host, and everything has to be perfect. And in, in the public eye, it has to be perfect because if they find one flaw, one thing out of place, they will 
they will point it out. So when I come on here every day, I try to make mm -hmm. sure that everything, not a lash is out of place, not a nail, nothing, everything is intact, yeah. tip top shape, like you just stepped out of the pages of, if you are a black girl growing up, Essence Magazine, because that's the representation that I mm -hmm. seen growing up was Essence Magazine. Y'all remember Hype Hair? If you went to the hairdresser with your mom, you would see the hair, the magazines right there on the table, the stylists would have, and you would see Nia Long or Mary J. Blige or one of the other girl, Brandy on the cover. And I'd be like, okay, ooh, I want I want to look like her. But when it all national, you don't want your hair like them. You want to look like them. But the stylist does a great job of that. And it's just like these were girls that we grew up watching, Brandy and uh, Mary J. Blige and Destiny's Child, Beyonce, of course. So, I mean, we always wanted to be these girls, but it's just like, our moms would tell us, embrace what God is giving you. You're beautiful just like them. Let me see what Island Yankee said. No shade. We are made in the image of God, but no shade. He blinked and making. it. I'm not about to play with you, Island Yankee. <laughs> I'm not about to play with you. Not today. But yes, that's a whole different conversation for another time. But listen, <laughs> I want you all to take something from this conversation. Even men, because men watch the platform too. And I don't want y'all to feel like I'm not catering to y'all as well too love yourself fellas love yourself because i know men would they will try to put on that tough exterior aspect especially black men our fathers our brothers they will put on that macho tough exterior where it's just like i don't feel insecure about certain things about myself i gotta be macho and strong listen talk about it talk about it because there are men who, who suffer with weight issues. You, you're perfect just the way you are. Yeah. You don't have to change a thing about yourself. Mm -hmm. Men go through body image issues as well, too. Not just women. Because there are days when we all look in the mirror and we pick out something about ourselves and we just tear ourselves apart. And I know for me, I was just like, I hate my nose. I hate my lips. I hate everything. Back then in my teen years. Now I'm pushing 30. I'm about to be 30. So I'm, I could be somebody's auntie up here. And you're <laughs> I'm about to be somebody's auntie. <laughs> and you are you beautiful. Too. I said, I'm about to be somebody's auntie. I'm pushing 30 years old. I can't be doing the same things when I was like 19 or 20. Mm -mm. Speaking out things about myself I don't like. Because I, I do have a niece in real life that watches me, that, that looks up to me. And says, okay, if she's beautiful, I'm beautiful. Because God made me and my mom made me. And if you need that reassurance that you're beautiful, go to the woman that brought you into the world, your mom. Go to your grandmother. They understand you. And me and my mother look just alike. Just alike. And I have a twin running around here somewhere. I say that all the time. But I have a brother and we look just alike. So it's just like, it's scary walking around looking in a mirror because he was just here this morning with the same face as you. Mm -hmm. So I, I love it. Same <laughs> eyes, same lips, same features, same everything. Yeah. I love all of you. Don't let this industry change you into something that you know you're not comfortable with because then you're going to want to go and you're going to want to surgically get something done again. You're going to want to change this and then you're going to be like, look, him and that's no shade she, she looked beautiful the way she was when she first came out who hasn't seen the hardcore the iconic hardcore album poster of her and the um bikini and everything i said she's beautiful but then the, as the years progress some men in the industry told her you're not good enough you're not what we're looking for i'm gonna go up on the night and i'm gonna change something i'm gonna change something i'm gonna change something do not let this industry ever ever change you. And that's, and that's what I tell actors who want to be in this industry as well. Don't get discriminated. I mean, don't get um, intimidated or don't get let down because what that director is looking for, he may not have seen it in you, but another director will see it in you. Everybody is different. Everybody has their own perspective. Everybody is looking for something. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I hope you guys are all men, women, girls, boys, taking something from this. Because it's not only self-love is not only a, it's not a woman thing. It's an everybody thing. 
And I need y'all to take away from this. Love yourself and the skin that you're in. And even I'm going to be a little go right now. Take it all off. Look in the mirror and tell yourself you are beautiful. You are beautiful. Hi, Le hi, Vern. Hi, Marcos Luis, who is the host of One Mic Night. We are here with the beautiful Deja McCowan. And we are just having some girl talk. We're talking about inner beauty. We talked colorism. We talked hair texture. We talked a lot in this interview. And she has a project. You know, yes, hair texture, microaggression. That's the thing. Another thing I need people to do is when I interviewed Cherry Johnson, she said she taught her daughter to appreciate her natural curl texture. Now, it's inflation. I'm not going to lie. Inflation is causing us naturalistas out here, all of my naturalistas out here, to, to go um, crazy because I know for leave-in, conditioner, co-wash, all of these things for natural hair, it's a lot. My mom is natural. I, me, I'm, I'm cream of nature. I, I'm relaxed. I have girls <laughs> love me all day, every day. And I would be like, oh, I want to look like the girl on the box. Uh, I'm relaxed. I, I couldn't do I yeah. couldn't do natural. I was natural. I had a real short afro. And that, you guys seen that picture on Facebook. It was like the Grace mm -hmm. Jones thing. And it fit my face because I wanted, I'm always changing up my hair, experiment with my look. And mm -hmm. I said, you know what? Let me go long. Let me try long. Let me braid it down. Protective styling is also for relaxed hair as well, too. So for my, my relaxed girls out here. Don't be afraid to do that chop if you need to. Don't be afraid to cut it. I asked one of my male friends today, I said, should I cut my hair? Because I was going to do a bob for this interview, but I said, you know what? Let me go for something long and sexy for the dress that I'm wearing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I've done bobs before. I've done I've done the shortcut. I shocked people when I came on with the Tony Braxton pixie cut. Tony Braxton is just beautiful. Her features, everything. She can do it. And and Nia Long, those were the girls that that made me want to cut my hair back. So, yeah, wow, I love this. But if you're comfortable with going natural, do it. But inflation, baby, everybody's talking about inflation nowadays because. For natural hair products, it's a lot. Even for relaxed hair, to maintain relaxed hair. I know we would wrap our hair and stuff at night. Me, I sleep on a satin pillowcase, and I make sure that I use a good moisturizer and conditioner for my hair because it. I have yeah. fine hair, and it will break easily. I can't put too much moisture in it. I have to make sure I have just enough, not too much, but just enough so that my hair doesn't break off. I had lots for 12 years. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with doing the big chop. And you see a lot of women are doing it. And it's liberating. Um, what's her name? Sana Lathan. She did it. She did the big chop. Yes. And I was so proud. I said, yes, Sanaya. And she looked Tamia good, too. And Preston did it. So was... And her mm -hmm. sister, Tawanda, mm -hmm. cut it all off, too. She shocked me. So women are doing the big chop. It's nothing new. It is nothing new. They're saying, here, what is here to me? Right. I've done it twice. I did it uh, my senior year in high school, and then I did it um, my sophomore year Listen, in college. That there's nothing wrong with, I know a lot of, uh, for us as Black women, we get scared when that hair hit the ground. I watched America's Next Top Model, and I would feel so bad for those girls. I'd be like, oh, she's sitting in the chair, she's crying, she's wiping her tears. But in the end result, the cut would look so dope, because these fashion photographers and editors know what look they want on the models. And mm -hmm. I, I mean, it doesn't scare me at all. It doesn't scare me taking it there to go there and, and change what needs to be changed. Mm -hmm. If you're going to get into modeling, yeah, they're going to want you to change up your look. You're not going to be the same. Yeah. Some designers are going to want long hair. Some are going to want short hair. They're going to want a bob. They're going to want red. They're going to want blonde. I did it once for my locks. And then when I had chemo, yeah, and there's women out here that suffer from hair loss as well, too. Mm -hmm. And we can't hold on to certain mm -hmm. things. There is my next guest. We went a little bit over, but Danielle, 53, if you <laughs> want to join this panel, we're doing a great girl talk. I can interview both ladies if that works. Uh-oh, what happened to Deja? I think she froze on us. This is such a great conversation. Come on up, Danielle. It is three, girl. 
Uh oh, Deja left. I think she froze, but Deja, you're more than welcome to come back up. Um, I'm gonna do D Daniel Ward. Our next guest is here, Fashion Dolls. So if Deja wants to come back up and we all talk about it, it'll be a great thing. Let me see. Let me add Danielle. Where's my button? Hopefully, Deja will come back. Hey. Hello. Oh, hey, girl. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes I can hear okay. you. Okay. Good. Thank you Good for having you. me on. I'm glad to have you on. I'm glad to have two amazing women of color here along with myself on this platform today. So glad to have you. Um, I just got through chatting with DJ, um, and we did our girl talk, and now it's time for our girl talk with Danielle. So we covered a number of things in this industry. Our guest, Danielle, is not only an actress, but she is also a writer as well, too. Mm -hmm. So before we kick off this girl talk, Danielle, um, how has 2023 been for you so far? We are now officially in the middle of this month. We're about to go into February pretty soon. Mm -hmm. So how has 2023 been for you thus far? Pretty good. I have zero complaints. Zero complaints. Um, I'll be attending Sunday. Dance Film Festival next weekend, so I, I know, right? This on my vision board. It's it's crazy. I'm like, I can't believe I manifested this. But so I'll be doing Sundance next weekend, and I also my plan is to beef up my YouTube channel. So I am, I have a goal of writing one short, writing and filming one short a month, just to put on my channel, um, so people know that I'm a serious filmmaker, that I'm not just an actress, but I can write as well. And then I've got a few other things that I'm um, slowly getting into, like podcasting. So it'll be like a trickle effect. As the year goes on, I'll be adding more um, to my plate in my channel. So I'm excited about that. All right. And come on, Vision Boards. I do Vision Boards, too. I'm going to see if we can get Deja back in to join us as well. So this will be great. Okay. So you were born on October 9th. Libra, Scorpio, what's your zodiac? I... I'm September 15th, so I'm a Virgo. I'm a, okay. A Virgo, yep, yep. Good old earth sign. Yep. Okay, all right. Virgo, and I'm a Scorpio. So okay. It. All right. So, okay. You are an actress and a writer. You went on to do a number of projects as well, too. What made you get the bug? At what age did you say, okay, this is something that I want to do. This is a passion that I want to pursue in this business? Well, I'll tell you what. I made my first film, uh, I was casting my first film at 33, right? But before that, when I was a, when I was a kid, I lived in a project, so I couldn't like go outside and play because my mom would let me. So I would just act out my favorite television show. So like I was Wonder Woman. I was also like Laverne and Shirley. I did all, the, <laughs> I dream of genie. So I would act out all these shows by myself. But you know, when you're a kid, you're not like, oh, this is something I can really do. You know, it was never, even going through high school um, and things like that, I never really thought that it was like for me that I could do that. And then I started doing like little small plays and things like that in the church that I had was attending at the time. This was like early, early 20s. And I was like, okay, this is fun, you know, but I still wasn't thinking this is something I can pursue. So uh, there was a publication called the Illinois Times, because I'm from Illinois, I'm from Springfield, Illinois. Um, lived there most of my life before moving out here to Vegas. But there was a casting call for a movie called This Life Ain't Pretty, right? So I read the casting, and my first thought was, I was like, oh, I can, I've got time for this in my schedule, right? <laughs> so I, I showed up, it was a cold read, I showed up, and before I went in, I was sitting in the car, in near tears, I couldn't believe that I was doing that. I was terrified. I was absolutely terrified. I go in there to the audition and the writer director, she was like, what does your schedule look like this date? And I was like, is she for real? I mean, and I had a call back. I had to come back the following weekend and read, but she offered it to me on the spot. And I was like, oh my God. So after that whole experience, that audition process, and then actually filming it, I mean, as an actress, I don't think I was the greatest because at the time I don't have, I didn't have the skills that I have now. But um, it was a great experience because it let me know that well, other people saw things in me, but also kind of validated that hey, you know what, I can't move in this direction. So, 2009 was what started my film career. 
I guess. So, yep. And then it kicked off from there with writing and doing so much more throughout your career. Now, who are some some people that you look up to in the business that inspire you? And if you could work with any, who would they be? Oh, oh God, that's a hard one. Um, Angela Bassett. Oh, she's girl. I know you. She won that Critics Choice Award. <laughs> and yes, and uh, Viola Davis. And those are women that are they're fierce. And yes. if I visualize like myself being in the scene with them, like you have to bring it. But they're also people that you can learn from as well. You know. Um, so those two off the top of my head. Uh, oh my God, his name, um, he's on my vision board. Jesus. Starts with a W. He's like an, he's like a trained opera singer. Why can I not remember his name? Jesus. Okay. I'm going to think of it in like 20 minutes. Um, <laughs> okay. But those are just a few that I can think of. Um, I ain't even gonna lie, Meryl Streep. Love her. Meryl Streep is like on a supernatural level. It's kind of crazy. There's like a, a shift, and it's not necessarily in every movie, and Melissa Leo, Leo is another one that's like that, like their posture and things about their body language, and you're just like, if, it's, if it wasn't for like their voice, you would think that it was somebody else. And that is something I strive to be or do is be like that kind of actress when people are like, is that like, oh, I'm going to have to look at the credits and see because I transform. That's, that's the goal. So. Now you just named three of the most gutsiest women. This is my next question for you. For both of us as women of color. Mm -hmm. What, what does a woman, what does it take? What does it take? What would it take for a woman to be gutsy in the business? What are some of the characteristics, like the gusto? And what I mean by gutsy is what type of business ethics does she need to have to be in this business? Because you got to be able to balance it all, acting, directing. And the prime, ex the perfect example would be Regina King. Regina King mm -hmm. acts, directs, does it all. So mm -hmm. what advice do you give to young women that are looking to get into this industry? You have to be fearless and have thick skin. And I'm still learning how to have thick skin, you know, because I, I am a little bit sensitive, but then I also understand the business aspect of it as well. But you have to be fearless and don't care about the no's and you have to find, make your own way. Right now, we're at a point where we've never been where we can create our own content and publish it and get it out there. And we don't have to depend on somebody else's yeses. So I would say the gutsiest thing you can do is just say, just do it. And make those mistakes along the way because those mistakes are the biggest lessons to learn from. It's it's different from having somebody say, "Oh, well, you know, tell you what to do," but making those mistakes, bouncing back, and just keep pushing forward. Absolutely, absolutely. And I'm gonna add on to that as well too because my previous my previous guest, my first lady, mm -hmm. um, Dita, we kind of talked about this, and I'm gonna ask you too. Um, Danielle, as women of color, we both get labeled in this business whenever we speak out on something because that's required also being gutsy as well too. You guys know where I'm going with this. Whenever a woman speaks up and says, okay, this isn't right, this is not, you know, the business aspect of it in regards to pay or anything, we get labeled as three little letters, A, B, W, angry black woman. What are your thoughts on this narrative being pushed on women in Hollywood and just the entertainment and business? It's frustrating because to me, it doesn't allow us to embody our full human nature. You can be angry, you can be upset, but black women are personified as being mad or having an attitude. Whereas if you know our fair skin counterparts aren't labeled that way. You know, if they, they have a problem with something, people listen or are more, are more fully invested in that conversation. And that's something that I don't like, as well as, like, the strong Black women woman narrative. Girl, it, it really does something to your mental health. Like, I want to hug 
sometimes. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, it's not, I can't be strong all the time. And people have to know that and respect that and honor that. Um, but as far as the whole angry black woman narrative, I think the more that we can actually produce and write our our own stories and and not care about having a seat at anybody else's table we don't need anybody else to validate us and if we if we move within that i think um we may be able to change that that narrative yeah and these women are breaking boundaries um you've mentioned angela bassett angela bassett also is a director regina king um isa ray um shonda rhimes all of these women are breaking boundaries for women like us to say, okay, if they're not going to give me a seat at the table, I'm going to make my own table in my own room. Mm-hmm. And Shonda Rhimes did that with shows like Grey's Anatomy and so many others. Back in the day, I was just telling Deja, Deja, um, Living Single was a very good show. Of course, Queen Latifah. Yvette Lee Bowser, who is the creator of that show, you know, you really didn't see really many women of color back then in that time, in that era, directing and producing shows. I mean, Suzanne D. Pacey, she went on to do Sister, Sister and so many other shows. But back then, it was very little, very little. And it's just like in 2023 and in the early 20s, the, the 20th century now, we're seeing boundaries shift and, and doors and glass ceilings are being shattered for us to come into the room, create our own opportunities and spaces for the next generation and the next generation and the next generation of female producers out here. You're, you're seeing that. Absolutely. Absolutely. YouTube and, and even uh, other streaming platforms, it provides a way for us to, to sneak on in there, you know, so. Yes, and, and another thing, the industry is, I was just telling these also, um, the industry is so patriotic. It's, it's so misogynist. It's full of misogyny. Whereas we as women of color, we're not going to face misogyny. We're going to face misogyny war. And that is a totally different type of misogyny because you're Black, you're a woman, and they already do not think that you're capable for the job. And I'm gonna ask you the same question that I asked Deja also as well too, because these are two uh, incredible girl talks, and I feel like I'm chatting with both of my girlfriends. I wish I was both. I wish Deja could have joined us too. I don't know where she is, but I'm gonna message her, and I'm pretty sure she had to step out. But for you as a woman of color, Daniel, what are some of the challenges that you've had to face? Because I've said some of mine, and mine's is I've had to face colorism. I've been gaslit and told that oh, no, you're not qualified to do this because you're a woman, because you're Black. You're not what we're looking for. Maybe if you were another skin color, maybe if you did this, maybe if you changed this, and that's what they expect of us in this industry and in this business. So for you, Daniel, what are some of the challenges that you've experienced being a Black woman in this business? Honestly, I would say not being a good fit. Like, I'm not a size two, four, or six. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? I'm curvy, and I'm, I'm okay with that. But I, I have always felt that that was a little bit, just a little bit of a barrier, you know, because I don't know if, like, the roles, um, some of the roles that I've been cast in, like, the friend, like, not necessarily the love interest, or the you know. Character. Yeah, you know, stuff like that. And those roles are fine, too. But I do think that there's still that um the size issue going on and i used to stress about it a lot but now i don't i'm just like this is what you see is what you get what you see is what you get mm-hmm. you know so like i said i can create my own content whether i'm in it or not um and whether people see it or not and having to let go of if whether people like it so at first when i was writing i'd be like what is the audience going to think or how are they going to feel about this? And, and now I'm at a point where I'm just like, you know what? This story is good. Whoever the audience is will find it. And I have to be content with that, you know, because I don't want to change. I want to remain authentic and I want my authenticity to be in my writing and reflected in things that I produce. 
Um, but, but in a nutshell, really, I think that my size, now I will say, I cut off my hair in 2013, right? So I felt like, like at a time, at that time, I was like, I felt like I looked like every other black actress, you know, like my short at audition. And I was like, we all look the same. Say like I need to do something. I need to be able to walk in a room and people before I even say a word be like, okay. So my intention was to was to cut, do the big chop, and then just grow out my natural hair, right? But then when I, I cut it off, I was like, oh, I was like, I like the fade, you know. So I kept it. And let me tell you, the year after it was August of 2013, 2014, I did like two commercials and four films. So that kind of like validated for me that this was, it was the right choice, the right decision for me. And it, and, and it was very empowering. I wasn't expecting to feel as empowered as I did once all my hair was gone. That's another story to sell. And we're going to get to that. We just talked about that, how, you know, the industry puts microaggressions when it comes to black mm -hmm. people. And like you said, all of the actresses back then looked the same. They wanted us to have yep. long hair and things. And it's just like, because they already think black, they already think we look alike. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a whole other conversation. <laughs> but you remind me so much of an actress that said something similar when she did an interview. Um, Aisha Hines, yes. you guys know Aisha yes. Hines? Yes. Yes. Yes, her cheekbones. Yeah, yeah. Everything. She said, I went to Los Angeles and, and you girls that if you grew up in Brooklyn or wherever, you know about the doobie rap, you know, the um yeah, mm -hmm. the Brazilian everything. Y'all know about that. So she said she went to an audition in Los Angeles and she's like, Okay, what what am I gonna do now? It's it's not working for me. I need to do something that works for me. So she said she cut it all off and when well, she walks into a room, the same thing instantly recognize you have to be original in this business as a black woman because they expect us to look the same to have the same body type and that's not the case you know and there is a stigma on women who are curvier in the entertainment business mm -hmm. and they want you to have a certain look they're saying oh well can you cover this up can you put this i'm just like where I'm gonna put it to, I can't hide the curse, baby. I'm, I'm a black woman. We, we, you know, we all got something yeah. <laughs> on yeah. us. We, we're not gonna hide it. It's a part of me. Mm -hmm. So I, I hate that they do that as well, too. I've seen that go on in this industry and in this business. So I created this platform, Style by Stevie, to showcase that there's beauty in all forms. Mm -hmm. Men, women, all kinds of black beauty. You get to see it from all over the world here on this platform. And it's inclusive. So that's one thing that I wish the industry would change is the size requirements because in the mo even in the fashion world, from where I'm coming from, the fashion modeling world, mm -hmm. they will want the model to be uh, a size four, size zero, size two. And I'm just like, even in real life, sometimes you're not going to see someone that's going to be shaped like a perfect size four, perfect size zero, perfect size two. Mm -hmm. You know, this is real life. And we look on the magazine covers. We look here on Instagram. Deja just said that. It puts a lot of pressure on us. Yep. Because we expect that we're mm -hmm. supposed to look a certain way. We're supposed to be, you know, especially for my moms out there. And I'm pretty sure the moms out there can relate to this one as well, too. Mm -hmm. After you just had a baby and you give birth, you look at a picture of Beyonce and Beyonce's wearing a two-piece and she looks amazing beautiful woman but it puts pressure on the moms to be like okay am I supposed to bounce back that fast too so it was Sierra the singer Sierra Sierra said something and she said she posted a picture I mean stretch marks and all she didn't care she said this wow. is me this is me I'm not bouncing back for nobody in this entertainment business, when a woman just gave birth to a baby, even Cardi B, they put pressure on her as well, too. Like Cardi B said, I just had a baby. I am resting. I'm not in a hurry to do anything. She was in the bed, full face of makeup, looked beautiful. Looked like she, I think she was at Paris Fashion Week at the time that she just gave birth to her daughter. And she's like, I just had a baby. I'm not in a hurry to bounce back that quick. Stop putting pressure on women to bounce back after just having a baby. So 
the weight gain, all of these things, they won't understand what your body goes through. And it's just like your body shaming in a way. Stop putting pressure on people in general, period, to yeah. look like the next thing, like the Sports Illustrated model. And half of the times they kill themselves in the gym to look like that. I was like, uh -uh. I'm, I'm not about to put myself through that and put myself in a situation where I'm not comfortable with right. me. I want to love it too. And that includes the thickness. That includes everything. So that's why I'm thankful for people like Lizzo because yep. she's all about body positivity. She's all about uplifting men, women, even teenagers out here go through the same thing as well too. When they take that look in their mirror mm -hmm. and they're alone, them, it's not social media or anything. Their phone is down. And you beat them down, beat their confidence down so bad they start beating themselves up. Yeah. And it's just like, no, there is nothing wrong with you. It's something wrong with that person that's behind that keyboard that's typing whatever they're typing in those comments. You right. love and you embrace everything with you. I was a shapeshifter. When I started Style by Stevie, mm -hmm. I had the washing pads and, I, and I'll try to dig up in the archives and find that picture. I posted a picture and they said, oh my God, you're so skinny. I said, well, yeah. That, and I wasn't happy. I, I wasn't happy. Mm -hmm. I looked sick. And I said, let me put a little bit, my father was teasing with me. He said, let me put a little bit more beef, meat on these bones. So I, I watched Great Into Exhale just the other day, and that was the late Gregory Hines. It's the scene with him and Loretta Devine. Girl, I know you know what you know, <laughs> yep, yep, about. Yep, yep. And he said, I love a woman with a little meat yep. on her bones. I said, yes, yes, there are all men in the world. So, I mean, I'm perfect. There's nothing wrong with being a curvy woman, but that's to be expected in this business they will tell you and we've seen stories with school teachers now they will be fully dressed not like in a dress that i'm wearing today but fully dressed i mean suit jacket and all and they will pick out oh she's too curvy she's too this she's too yep. i'm like well even news anchor she needs to cover up i'm saying why do I need to tone down my femininity just to make you happy? That part. My femininity is what makes me divine. It's what makes me feel like a woman at the end of the day. What I'm wearing, yes, I'm professional, but that doesn't mean that I can't do my job. I'm capable of doing my job and not being too sexy, especially when I'm in an environment where there's children. I'm fully clothed. I'm not half naked. What is the problem? Yep. I think as a society, as a Western society, because we are patriarchal, and it has completely erased the divine feminine aspect, right? So, you know, when you look overseas and other cultures, um, they have both male and female deities, right? But here, we don't. It's very male-oriented. So the, everything, I think it all goes, everything is energy, right? So when you take away or chip away at the divine feminine, like you are completely messing up a, a whole society. You know, there's no balance there at all. And, and I, I love what you just said, that divine feminine. When I, back then for us being black girls, black women, we grew up and we would watch Della Reese on TV. We would watch Eartha Kitt. We would watch mm -hmm. Sister Tyson, Pam Greer. Those, these women oozed sex appeal. Dorothy Dandridge yep. is another one. These women oozed sex appeal. And they did it in a way where it was like, okay, this is me. Well, Pam Greer was on a whole different level. If y'all seen Foxy, if you know, you know. <laughs> if you see Coffee and Friday Foster, you know, you know. Yeah. But Pam said, you know what? I'm unapologetically I'm, I'm unapologetically sexy. I'm unapologetically who I am. I'm unapologetically a black woman. So I'm going to walk in with my boots and my dress. Yep. I'm going to walk in. And she had a rifle at the time when she was playing Foxy. And she had her afro. I said, and Fox, Cleopatra Jones was another one too. So growing up, watching films like that inspires black girls growing up. And then Sister Tyson just came in with her divine grace, her femininity, and just her unapologeticness. Eartha Kitt was just her oozing sex appeal. Like Lola Falana was another one too. So I'm naming all the beauty icons from the 70s because these women were just in their own. They owned it. Yeah. And they didn't care, especially Eartha. Like they just came into their own and they're saying, this is me, take it or leave it. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorites, I would have to say, God rest her soul, was Nina Simone. Mm -hmm. Nina Simone was unapologetic with yep. who she was. She spoke out about 
so much going on in the world, from civil rights to everything. And she did it in a way where she was just like, I don't care if you call me angry. You can call me whatever you want to. I'm going to get up from this table because that's one of her posts, and I love it. Get up from the table when love is no longer being served. Mm -hmm. And I am going to step into who I am, my divine feminine. But each woman, Dorothy Dandridge, we've seen the obstacles that she had to go through. For her being told, no, you need to go through this other door, Blacks only. All of these other women as well, too, spoke about these experiences from Della Reese to Pam Greer. They spoke about it. They, the things that they've encountered being a Black woman in this business where so male dominated and at the time it was racially divided because Blacks need to go here. Mm -hmm. Whites need to go here. You go from this fountain and this fountain. You go to this bathroom. This is your bathroom. And they've bro broken boundaries. And then in the late 80s, one of my idols, she did. She was so fearless and just unapologetic and wild and bold. And I think I embody just a little bit of her was Grace Jones. Great. I knew it. I knew it. My mom loved her some Grace Jones. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. And I just admire how fierce she was. Mm -hmm. Minus the hit in the interviews, y'all. If you know, you know. <laughs> <laughs> she was so unapologetic. She came in with her bold fashions and just speaking the truth. Um, she did something in this on XOXO Confidence. I love their channel. I follow Essence Magazine. I follow Madame Noir. All of these platforms that speak up for us as Black women. Um, mm -hmm. Shout out to my uh, no Sugar, No Cream magazine, Black Woman Own, um, all of these platforms that speak up for us as Black women. Um, she said something where I can tap into my softness, my softness. Mm -hmm. my and she was in the interview looking just as beautiful as ever because Grace had the jaw bones, the bone structure. She yes. was so tall and she had the legs, like everything about her screamed model because she did model mm -hmm. also. And in the interview, she was talking about, I can be soft. For the roles, I play this powerful woman. Mm -hmm. But in real life, like you said, it goes back to that strong Black woman narrative. Mm -hmm. Because we see these type of characters being portrayed on television. And it's just like, yeah, we're kind of like this in real life when it comes to business. But we want to be vulnerable. We want to be healed. We want to be loved. We don't want to be the super woman all the time. And to right. Roger P. Henson, said something in an interview and that clip is still going viral about being the strong black woman mm -hmm. where it's not like you feel invincible and it's just like there are days when i don't want to be invincible i don't mm -hmm. want to have to wear this cape all the time i want to wear my heart on my sleeve i want to be emotional i want to be held i want to be vulnerable yes black women we are strong but there are days where we just like okay I'm about to put on me some Patti LaBelle and just start crying. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, really, yeah. Yeah. I do not feel like being strong today. I just want to put on some Patti LaBelle or Aretha Franklin and just go in the dressing room or wherever and just start boo -boo, crying. Yeah. I don't want to be strong today. I don't want to have to save the world. And that's what's expected for Black women, mm -hmm. even in political positions of power. And we're seeing that with the Maxine Waters and uh, Simone Sanders and our, our Vice President Kamala Harris. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's ridiculous that these women still have to endure the misogyny, the misogynoir in, in high position. Yep. And it's just like you have to be so tough and stoic because if you break, they're going to say, oh, she's weak. Yep. She's not capable of being the Vice President. She's not capable of doing this because she's weak. Listen, women were built to be emotional creatures. We, even men, men were built to be emotional as well, too. But there are days where we're not going to want to be strong all the time, like the characters that you see on TV, like the Foxy Browns. If you've watched Empire, which was a great show, Cookie Lions, her type of character. Right. Or Olivia Pope, Carrie Washington. If you know, you know. So these type of characters, they kind of expect Black women to be like, and it's just like in real life, yeah, in certain business aspects, we can be like these women, gutsy, head on and straightforward about what we want. But then when we do that, we get labeled ABW. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it's going to be, a ch I'm going to take that challenge. I'm going to be labeled ABW because when I see that something isn't right, especially in the industry that is so full of patriarchy and misogyny, 
where men will try to, because they, some of them will try to gaslit your, gaslit your experience and say, that didn't happen. You don't know what you're talking about. And I think it was Cam Newton who did an interview and it was a black female news anchor. Mm -hmm. And she asked him about a playback or something football players do. And he just kind of scoffed and made his face like, what do you know about this? Like, you're not, they try to downplay your integrity. Some of them will try to downplay your credits. Some of them will try to downplay your experience, your resume, because you're black and you're a woman. But it's just like, well, you're a black man. You should understand where I'm coming from because we both already have strikes against us. We're both right. black, but we're experiencing different things. Yep. I'm experiencing it because I'm a woman. They don't think I'm fit for it. You're a man, so you instantly, the ball is in your court. Whatever you say goes. Sometimes there's a lot of some men that are jealous of you, you know, and your accomplishments. So then they, <laughs> then they're insulting you. They're intimidated by power. Because because they, they, yep, yep, yep. And something um, as far as like the strong black woman. So I, I wrote and shot a, uh, my very first short film in 2021, right? So right now I've got it circulating at some film festivals. Hopefully um, I'll be hearing back from some, I think at the end of this month. So out of the, everything that I've written, I said, okay, what's the most important thing that I can put out like right now? And it's called Off the Grid. And it's all black and brown cast, um, but it has to do with trauma and mental health. Oh, yeah. And how, like, in, in our community, is not talked about. It's getting talked about a lot more now, so it's, like, cool. But it's, like, it, you feel ashamed or can be made to feel ashamed if you do suffer from anxiety or depression or, or anything. You know, so then you you hold that up and you don't talk about it. So I kind of wanted to do a short on that. So I have another series of shorts that I'll be shooting next month. It's three in a series, and it's called Trigger Warning. And it's three acts, and it, it basically goes down how depression plays out. So, like, the first one, Act One, is called Trigger Warning the Shadow. And it's like, like the physical embodiment of depression, like when it sits in. And then the second part has to do with your thoughts, if they go unchecked, you know. And then there's a third aspect, but Black cast, because I just think it's so important. Because if we don't talk about it, we will sit there and suffer alone, just by ourselves, being our own thoughts. And not reach out to like a trusted family member or a trusted friend or a hotline of some kind. You know, there's help out there, but there's there's still a stigma of shame. Um, I know some, some people think that it's if they reach out for help, they're weak. They attribute it to weakness, but it, it's not, not weakness. You know, you, there's help out there that you have to get. Um, and sometimes I think we need to check our friendship circles too. You know. So, yeah, I'm big on mental health and talking about it. And I talk about it a lot on the platform as well, too. And I'm glad that you spoke on that because in the Black community, for so long, we continue to sweep it up under the mm -hmm. road. People, people that are in the entertainment business who are just like Taraji P. Henson, Jennifer Lewis, on the rap side, um, Big Sean, the controversial Lil Wayne, all of them, they're talking about my mental health and saying, I don't feel like myself today. Yeah. Yeah. So if they can say it, I can say it as well too. Mm -hmm. And people have to get to the point where it's like, I'm comfortable with normalizing my mental health and I'm not okay with being okay. Because mm -hmm. in the black community for years we've swept it up under the rug. But a lot of people will resort to this. Well, just pray to God and, and yes, I am a faith based person. I'm not Ooh. you know, yeah, yeah. But they say this is my thing. Yes, God can help. But faith without work is yeah. dead. God put this here for a reason. Talk to somebody. Mm -hmm. Talk to somebody. There is nothing wrong with seeking therapy and sitting on that red couch yep. and talking to Dr. Phil. And, Absolutely. and it's like what you do and Dr. Phil had the conversation. You, you get you, you got you, I got you. Yeah, you, you got me. You know, you're going to get God. So, <laughs> but at the same time, we have to realize that. We have to normalize it. Talk about it. 
because on the inside, it's just like you guys remember the show Good Times, right? Yep. James, James, and that's most black men so in the household. Most black men will act like nothing is wrong, and it's not the black men. Sometimes, sometimes it's us, the black women. But this episode was about James, and James. I think it was Michael and everybody. They was like, "Well, Dad, something's wrong. We think you suffer from depression or high blood pressure." And he took that chair, and I don't know how planned it was. He took that chair, and he slammed that chair into the wall, and the whole chair broke. He just like, ain't nothing wrong. And then he slammed the door. So when it comes to the black household and what goes on in this house, stays in this house, break that stigma. Yep. If it's causing me trauma, if it's hurting me on the inside mentally, if it's draining to me, I am going to talk about it. Yeah, and we have to get rid of that type of stigma that oh well you know just just let just do this and it's gonna be okay I'm gonna be okay I'm gonna be all right. Where some men they will try to tough it out and I'm just like no. But now it's 2023. Men are starting to open up more and talk about mental health and I'm seeing it on a lot of male based podcasts and they're just saying wow my mental health is you know I feel good I, I feel good that I opened up. Open up to us, the women. Open up to, to the people in your family, your girlfriends, your wives, your sisters. That's why we're here. Your family in general. We understand you. And we have to. One thing I want to say is some women will, I think just as black women, we need to support our black men in that. Yes. And just be a listening ear and not always have an opinion, you know, and just be a support. Yeah. Absolutely. Be the rock. Yeah. And we have to support each other. And it goes it goes both, both ways. Yep. Both mm -hmm. ways. We have to support each other. Meg the Stallion even spoke out about mental health. Mm -hmm. Um she came to the foundation because of the the I don't even have to get into the list study, but if you know, I'm glad she she chose to protect her peace. And it goes back to what you were saying about your circle. And I said that a few minutes ago. Be careful who you add into your circle because not mm -hmm. everyone you think is there for you is genuinely there for you. They're there to latch on some reason. It's up to you to define that reason for what they're there for right. in your life. So I have a small circle and I'm thankful for it. Even Meg, you know, the advice that I will give to her is you're at peace, baby girl. You're happy. And I'm happy for her. I'm a big Meg Thee Stallion fan. And a lot of black women have supported her. And I'm, I support her. We all support her and stand with her because of that trauma that she went through. And I commend her for speaking out and saying that my mental health is not intact. After mm -hmm. this trauma to me, I'm not okay. Yeah. And she just broke down, cried online. She was here on the ground and she went live and she cried. And she was trying to hold back, fight back tears. I said, yeah, she's gonna break. Mm -hmm. And it just, my heart was hurt for her that that happened. And it's just like, whenever we speak up about these things, make it valid, male or woman, on any side of the spectrum when it comes to mental health we there's or it's going to be a like we just lost twitch mm. we, we lost even twitch boss that's that's an, that's an example um kurt cobain and yeah. so many other prince michael jackson even though they they didn't do that mentally depressed the tabloids reading all of these things about you it can take a toll on your mental health yep Absolutely. And Beyonce's mom, Tina Knowles, said her daughter does not read the tabloids. She doesn't read or look at any reviews on her albums or anything. Beyonce does not. And that's the type of energy that I have adapted. I said I've adapt adapted the Beyonce energy because she doesn't respond to it. And then when she comes out with music or photos, she's beautiful as ever, like a care in the world, because she doesn't look at the negativity, the comments, the anything. Because that can literally drain you at the right. end of the day. Right. Being and in you, this entertainment business. Go ahead, I'm sorry. No, I was going to say, you don't want to give energy to something because the moment you give energy to it, it, it gains momentum. And it's just like, some, well, something is wrong with me. No, there's nothing wrong with you. There's something wrong with that person mm -hmm. because they're bringing you down. They're bringing you down to the gut where they're at. You don't need to be there. You're up here. You stay up here and you protect your water. And I said this last week on the platform, my time, my water, my healing, my mental health is all that matters. So 
why are you trying to bring me down where you're at because you're not happy in your life and you want me to be in this position with you and Ayala Van Zant said it best it was a clip that someone posted yesterday she said it's okay to tell somebody that they hurt you it's okay to tell somebody that they caused you pain they caused you trauma because in real life, we all suffer from some sort of emotional hurt. You just can't take that out, that anger or frustration out of other people and hurt other people in the process. Right. And my mom was, was just the other day to someone. You can't hurt other people. It's not going to end up well for you because I believe in karma. <laughs> and I've done things that I'm not proud of. And Lord knows, girl, and yeah, when I tell you it would eat me up, I'd be sitting there in this room like, Lord Jesus, why me? My anxiety is through the roof. Like, why did I do this to this person? And it's just like, it's my way of taking accountability. So, shout outs to my island Yankee. He's in here somewhere. He would say, child, quit move, reliving the past. Mm -hmm. Your past does not dictate your future. Yeah. And you have to move forward. You, yeah, I, you can live with it and learn from it. But you, at the end of the day, as an individual, you can't change the things that have happened in your past. Right. And that doesn't mean go out here and hurt other people in the process of your healing. Because you never know what a person could be going through in real life, too. We never knew what Twitch or anybody right. who did that was going through. We, we never know. And we see the glitz, the glamour, the happiness on the outside. But when we turn off the cameras, the the video, the, the everything, the phones, everything, we put all of that down. And it's just us in that moment. We're sitting there and we're suffering because nobody knows it. And Jennifer Lewis has been transparent and candid about her bipolar disorder right. and the person and things. And she said, you know what? A lot of people act like their stuff don't stink. We all have something going on with us mm -hmm. in the end of the day. And we can't sit up here and pretend like it's all silver and gold and diamonds and it's not. Yep. That's how yeah, that's how I feel about social media in general. It's just a a lot of times. It's not with everybody, but it's just an illusion, you know, and people just keep putting up all these illusions and other other people strive to reach that, whatever that illusion is, and it's never based in fact, you know, or real life. So I don't know. I should beef up my my social media presence, but there's a part of me I feel like if I do just for the sake of posting, that I'm gonna lose my authenticity, and I'm kind of and I'm scared of that. Girl, I say do it. It's something that because there's so many platforms here on Instagram. Mm -hmm. That say you know, for um black women is one platform that I follow here. So many, like now I mentioned Madame Noir, of course, Essence magazine. Our moms growing up would have an issue of Essence magazine, and we would see the pretty lady on the cover, and we'd be like, Okay, we want there. But it's messages in there that are for us as like black women. Mm -hmm. And then there's platforms like Black Girl Mental Health. There's a platform like that here on Instagram. I follow them. And they've given the five steps that women, black women can do to protect their mental health. And I loved it. I followed every one of them. And one of them is protecting your peace, making sure that you're grounded with who you are. You're confident with who you are. Of course, confidence is key. But when it comes to your mental health and if you're not feeling okay, tell someone, talk to someone. It's okay to normalize therapy. It was, who was it? Tia Mori. Tia Mori. Um, sister childhood she's been in our life and from in the limelight since childhood yeah. her and her sister Tamara and she did a TikTok and she looked beautiful she was walking down she had on her heels and her dress and everything and she said this is how I feel after coming from a therapy session because she went through a divorce and everything with her husband Corey and they're still on good terms like at the end of the day they did a post for Christmas or was it New Year's and they said hey we this we separated or whatever but we're doing this for our kids and it was beautiful and she said we're working this out as family we're working this out as family we're doing this together and then the next few days she put up something that says i'm coming from my therapy session this is how i feel and she was dancing in the tiktok and everything because she does a lot of tiktoks and i said i commend her please take advantage of these mental health these therapists out here 
because they're not just here for their own health. They're here to help you. There's nothing wrong with going to a counselor. For years, we as black people, we've been taught, oh, well, well, you don't want to look crazy. Don't go right. to a therapist. But listen, there's, there's other ways that are not healthy that people go through yep. that think that it's going to help them. You can drink yourself, Jennifer Lewis said it, you can drink yourself to death, smoke yourself to death. That's not going to help. It can numb the pain temporarily. Right. But find that outlet. Talk to somebody. And I thank, I thank God because I just spoke with my cousin today. We had a loss in the family. My aunt passed away. Oh, and sorry. thank you. And she, um, I spoke with my cousin and the rest of the family. We have a whole family group chat on Messenger. And we check in to see, like, okay, you good? You good, cousin? You good? You good, aunt? You good? So I texted my cousin the day before we got ready for the interviews and everything. And I said, how's everybody holding up? I know I couldn't get down to the family events and everything, but how is everybody holding up? Even my mom. My mom would ask me, did you text your cousin Sherry? Shout out to my cousin Sherry. Did you text this person? Did you text that person? I said, yeah, I texted them to make sure they're good and okay. And I try to make time in my schedule because being in this business, the entertainment business, like you're busy on the go constantly, but you still make time for family. And my mom, she always instilled that into me. She said, no matter how big you get, you can be on Oprah level. I ain't there yet because I don't have Oprah's paychecks, but it's <laughs> <laughs> right, It's coming. It's coming. I'm manifesting it. Whatever's okay. coming in the universe. But I said, no matter how big I get, I will always make time for friends and family. And I've always stayed the same person that I am. Even some of my classmates from school would be like, wow, you changed. There's something different about you. You look different. I said, yes. I, I found a good makeup artist and hairstylist and all of that. <laughs> But I feel happy and confident with who I am. Yeah. When we were together, I wasn't happy because I was bullied. All mm. of that trauma that, that lived with me throughout childhood, mm -hmm. that, you know, now into my adult years, I've learned to let it go. And the people that used to put me down, that used to bring me down, that have watched me and bring me in that place where it's just like, mm -mm. Mm -hmm. But now watching me grow, as we say, glow up or whatever, mm -hmm. to see the success that I have, they now want to come around. And I'll just be like, God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. I, but, I, you know, I don't have anything bad to say about you. But keep it moving. I can't. Yes. Just yep. do what you do. Mm -hmm. Do it. I thank you. Keep moving. You're watching the show. You're watching the platform. And you're taking something from it. But hey, we were kids at that time, and I can't blame myself because I wasn't the a part of the. Well, I wasn't the blame for it. I was the one that was being picked on. Mm -hmm. So, hey, you, when you're children, you do as children. When you are adults, because I'm pushing thirty, and I was just telling Deja this. I said, I'm about to be so, so pretty soon. I'll be somebody's auntie, and I said these are things. <laughs> these are things that I do not want to live with me in my adult years because trauma can haunt you in your adult years. I'm telling you. And you pass it on. Yeah, it's right. like a legacy. And there were certain things, like when I moved from Illinois here to Vegas, I felt like I was breaking, I don't want to say necessarily general generational curses, but kind of, because I was completely starting fresh, figuring out, okay, this is my life. I got one go of it. It's now or never, you know? So I came out here to figure out to hear my own voice because sometimes you have to to get away from what you're familiar with and who you're familiar with to really figure stuff out and figure you out and not have any influences um that are against you to be honest you know so that's also part of mental health too <laughs> sometimes you gotta leave yeah, <laughs> you know change is beautiful scenery is beautiful changing for the better mm -hmm. is beautiful and I would panic because I would be like, oh, my God, I got to start all over again. I would be so stressed out. And it's just like, why stress about the little things? There's nothing wrong with change. To me, I look at it as changing our hairstyle, changing our outfit. If you can do that, you can go through anything else. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, no, okay, bring it on, God. Give me this challenge because it's like each and every day for me is like a test. And in certain situations, it's, it's like he's testing you. He wants to see if you're going to pass or fail. And I know that I've passed the test. It's been difficult, yeah. but I've passed the test. 
because I've gotten through those obstacles and challenges to get where I, and I still am getting where mm -hmm. and it's going to be easy. Healing is ugly. It but is. But in the end result, it's beautiful. Yeah. And I thank God for that. I, I thank him for that. Every day my mom says, oh no, just a fan. <laughs> that was my mom. Sorry about that. But yeah, um, it's just those little things that you have to take with you in life as milestones to make you even better or the better person. Mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm thankful. I truly am. Yeah. Yeah. Same here. Um, in 2020, you know, all COVID and everything. So I moved to Vegas in 2018. And, you know, before I moved, I was like, oh, I'm going to make friends easier, easily. You know, it's going to be fine. And as soon as I got here, my plans, which I had with, you know, other people were involved and like fell through. So like I was flying by the seat of my pants for like the first year and a half. And then I was like, okay, I need to get connected, you know, with the film industry out here. But then COVID happened and I was like, what's happening with my life? And like, I was at a point where I was like, the lowest I'd been in a very long time. And I was like, I don't know what to do. So... And I, I did, didn't have a vision board at that point, but I like to write down, um, like, okay, Dan, what's practical? What can you do? So I did this little thing. I did my little prayer. Because sometimes I'll, like, if I'm really going through it, I will, like, light a candle. And right. then I'm, I call on everybody. I talk to God, my angels, my spirit team. I'll be like, come on, huddle time. We got to talk. Right. So <laughs> I, it was one of those moments. And so I lit a, little, a candle. And I had my list, and I was like, I don't know what's going on with my life, you know. I was like, I know the world is shut down, but I'm like, I moved out here to do this one thing, but I don't see how this is going to come to fruition. Like, I couldn't see the plan, right? So don't think I'm crazy, but there's this voice, and I've always had this voice. Sometimes it's like, like audible, 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 like for real, for real, and sometimes it's just like that still voice. But that voice said, just keep writing. Because I was like, I don't know anybody or like crew. Who's my lighting person? Who's my sound? Like all of these other aspects. I'm like, I don't know how that's going to happen. And that voice was just like, keep writing, right? So I was like, okay. That was October. October of 2020. After that, then I started meeting people. Little by little, meeting people in in hindsight, I'm like, wow, my team just started coming, you know, that kind of thing. And I'm like, this is crazy. Like, one of those things or of stories that I'm like, people wouldn't believe you. Some people just wouldn't believe you um, that happened. So I felt like me moving out here was like a big faith move. And it was something I had to do so God can be like, okay, she's serious. He's for real. Now I can start adding things and putting things in order. So it's quite a ride. And I don't always know what's going to happen, which is crazy. Being a Virgo, I like to be in control and not having control and knowing certain outcomes is kind of makes me crazy sometimes. But I'm thankful because how things turn out are better than I could have even prayed for and asked, you know. So, yeah. And here I am about to go to Sundance. Crazy. There's nothing wrong with that. And Sundance, that's a major, major achievement. So those inner voices, your gut instinct, mm -hmm. Oprah said something um, in, the, in the extent of following your gut instinct. So that inner voice, that's your gut instinct telling you, mm -hmm. I need to make it move. Mm -hmm. I need to do this. So listen to your gut instinct. It never leads you wrong. Yeah. Especially if it's a career move or a business venture that you want to go for, go for it. And I'll give you an example. Um, Dwayne The Rock Johnson started off with seven dollars in his career, and he went on and did what he had to do. And look at him now, seven dollars, seven dollars. Good Lord, seven dollars to his name, and he started off in the business. What, of course, we know him as you know mm -hmm. the wrestler, the wrestler, and then he went on and did what he had to do, and look at him now, a right on the big screen. He's still mm -hmm. a big screen. So you have to start somewhere. You have to take that. And that's because he took that leap of faith. He did it on faith. Yeah. To this business, some people quit their jobs and it's just like, okay, what, what am I going to do now? I done did it now. And then in the end result, you hear them 
oh, I'm going to be on this. I'm going to be working on a Spike Lee project. I'm going to be working with Ryan Coogler on Black Panther. And all of these major things start to happen. So, no, no I'm not like Beyonce. Beyonce got one line and um, was it Break My Soul? And, and she got in trouble for it. She said, I just quit my I just quit my job or something like that. I said, and everybody was like, no, <laughs> no, 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 do not take the outdated advice. But hey, she kind of got a point. They yeah. Can't say why? Yeah. Because if acting or directing is something that you are passionate about, and your parents put you through school, and after that they just like, okay, you on your own. You got to do this. Mm-hmm. You got to do what you got to do. Yeah. If you got a job and you just like, okay, I want to make that move. And then you might, just might, you never know where the gold ticket can lead you. Because you even remember on American Idol, they would give you that gold ticket, what, to Hollywood? Mm-hmm. You never know where the golden ticket can lead you, where the door could open. You got to start somewhere. And I love hearing people's stories from how they started. Like Tyler Perry started, I mean, he was sleeping in his car. I know. Oh. Story. So you have to start somewhere. And I know people are like, well, it takes money. But you have to do something. You, If it's working someplace, you have to find something to do that you're passionate about. And you have to invest in yourself. Take those acting classes. Take whatever online classes to, to learn the skills to take you to that next level. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So you have to start somewhere. And look at our girl, Dang, here. She is going to be at Sundance. And that's a major, major achievement. Yes. So I'm excited about that. I get my hair done tomorrow. I'm like, this is like a week longer than usual, you know? So I'm just like, ah. But yeah, I'll be blonde and uh, more closely cropped tomorrow. <laughs> okay. All right. And yes, that's a big achievement. So if this is something, this is living proof right here, this platform. If this is something that you're serious about doing, acting, singing, dancing, directing, go for it. Leap. This is your year. 2023 is your year. And it's my time. I say it's my time, my water, my energy my presence, my blood, sweat, and tears, and everything that I put into my craft. If you're passionate about doing it, go for it. Sometimes taking a jump can be scary, but you never know if you don't take that jump. Even with me, I, there was times of uncertainty in my life. Am I ever going to have guests on the show for for April? Because I've been doing, ripping and running trying to get things prepped for April, and so far it's coming along. It's kind of bumpy, but I'm happy with the results. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I want to continue on each month i want to continue on with amazing interviews amazing guests so it was uncertainty like oh god i'm not going to be able to have guests on in april because i couldn't find people but people were luckily wanting to interview with me so you never know the end result right. of what happened if you don't try if you don't take that leap of faith you know i just yep. told someone it's time to leave absolutely absolutely china Absolutely. And it's scary taking that leap. But in the end result, you will feel so much happy. My DMs are on fire right now. Thank y'all so much. (laughs) Thank y'all for all the love. Y'all are loving the girl talks. Y'all are loving the platform. I appreciate it. And that's why I do what I do to make people happy. People are like, well, what are you getting out of it? Someone asked me just the other day, well, what are you getting out of it? Making people happy, bringing people joy. That's what I get out of it. I don't do it for money. I don't do it for fame. I don't do it for any of that. I don't do it for the views. I do it because my mom says you have a gift. I've always wanted to be a talk show. It's always. And I said, I want to bring people happiness. Like Danielle just mentioned the pandemic. You know, we've been inside. And yeah. it's just like, oh, Lord, we're looking at these walls. We're feeding. Your mind is just racing. You're going crazy because you're in times of uncertainty. And it's just like people need something where they can look at instead of just looking at everything on social media, the news and everything. Turn on something that that brings you joy, that brings you happiness. And if my platform can be that or other platforms can be that, do that. Find that one platform, that one platform that makes you happy and brings you joy. You got to be willing to Thank you, China. Sorry. Girl, this is a sign. 
Oh my God, the whole jumping thing. Yeah. Yep. Look at that. And that's that. That is that right there. Yeah. Thank you, China. Yes. Thank and that's what it's you. about. Thank this you for having on, China. That support system, 100%. We don't went over, y'all. <laughs> Both of our girls talk about <laughs> happy sometime. We got one more interview. And our next interview with an amazing actor from the South Carolina area, Geek J. Smalls. But Danielle, before we let you go, are there any encouraging words that you would like to leave to young Black women who are also following in your footsteps, who want to be a writer, who are watching both of us, as well as Deja in the beginning, who've watched all three of us as Black women blossom and come into our own as the boss Black women that we are? What advice would you give to these young girls that are watching us? I I would say, number one, you don't need anybody to validate you, your existence, or your story. You don't need anybody. You just need you and your vision. Take that vision and run with it, even if people think that you're crazy, because whatever that still small voice inside of you or whatever that, that passion is um, that you know that you were designed and created to do, just do it. And we are at a time now where we can create our, our own content, we can publish our own, self-publish our own books. There are ways to get your content, your craft out there, just do it. And when you make that decision inside that that's what you're gonna do, things are gonna just start falling into place and you're gonna be like, holy shit, how did that happen? But that's, that's just how things work as far as like manifesting. So keep that vision alive and don't let anybody deter you from that. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is our Girl Talks with two amazing women, Deja McCowan, Deja McCowan and Danielle Ward. Make sure you follow these ladies and let everyone know where they can follow you, Danielle. My YouTube channel is, uh, it's Baldy Locks Productions. So it's B-A-L-D-I-E. L-O-C-S Productions. Follow me there, IG, Danielle.dward. And then my website is DanielleDward.com. And when I start casting, I'll be putting notifications up on my, uh, on all my platforms, but on my website, you want to take a look at. So, and if you just want to send, send me an email, you can email me at Danielle underscore Dward at Yahoo.com. Y'all make sure y'all follow me, the movement women. I'm glad that I've had the pleasure. I wish we could all three do the panel. Maybe next time yep. I'm going to message both of you so we can set that up because I really wanted both of y'all to meet. Like we both were doing amazing girl talks and I feel like I was chatting with my girlfriends because we talk about stuff like this in real life. So it's great to have both of you on. Thank you, Danielle. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Same here. You too. And I hope you guys enjoyed this one. Coming up next, I've just seen him in here, DJ Smalls, ladies and gentlemen. And these girl talks will be uploaded to my YouTube channel, Style by Stevie Daytime. And the ladies will receive a copy. I will send them the links so they'll be able to do it. So you guys, I'm going to start a new live and I will be right, right, right back.